do it afterwards. All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to our weekly Bible study. Trust you're having a glorious day. Hopefully you're enjoying the cool weather inside because it sure is not cool outside. I was talking with um, last night with our daughter-in-law who lives in Cleveland, and they're predicting to get the 90 degree weather that we've had here, except we're a little used to it. At least we have a couple months where we're used to it. When they're up that far north, mm, doesn't work too well. So we're well, glad you're here. Well, I thought what we'd do is kind of, kind of take a break here with one slide and kind of review where we're at. Okay, some of you are new, some of you haven't been along all for the entire time. And so I want to look at six or seven trends that kind of started as we looked at the history of the church. And the first one was as the church grew in numbers, the structure also grew and became much more hierarchical. So for example, if you read the, the book of Acts and you read Paul's letter to Timothy and Titus, you can kind of see that there were two types of leadership in the church. There were elders and there were deacons. Now, the elders had other names for them. Sometimes they were called, later on, they would be called priest, but that was the same thing, an elder or the Episcopal. Those were also the, the elders. They would be like the, the pastoral staff. They weren't necessarily paid positions, um, but you had primarily those two. It, was, it didn't take too long, as in some of the cities where the church got rather large, that you had kind of created a separation of the bishop, who also was an elder, but now the bishop began to take on a much more uh, designated and uh, streamlined role, and you had elders reporting to the bishop. So the bishop in many churches was like the lead pastor who had other elders or priests or pastors, whatever term you want to use, reporting to them. Eventually, those bishops in some of the big churches like in Alexandria or Antioch or Ephesus, later on Rome, actually, it was too big for them to really handle it. And so they created what later on would be called the archbishop or the bishop of bishops. Okay. And that's kind of what the Bishop of Rome or the Bishop of Antioch were. Um, they, they were higher level. They were over other bishops, other elders within their church. So you can see that the size forced it to have to be a little bit more structure. Now, what was interesting was as the church progressed through, especially when we get into 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th century, um, it became very hierarchical in terms of, you know, lots of layers, lots of layers in the church. Uh, when you see the early church, it was, it was pretty much flat. You got the apostles and, and then you're right into the churches. Okay. But as you get larger and more complicated people, you create more and more of a structure. So that's one of the trends. Uh, just probably a natural phenomenon. That doesn't mean that the structure necessarily was wrong. We could argue about whether it created its own problems because of structure. And I worked for Phillips, 150,000 people worldwide. And we brought a consultant in and said, you had too many layers in the organization. They looked at the CEO, the head of the company, all the way down to the factory worker. And they said, the, the greater amount of layers you have, the more difficult it is to manage the organization and get unity and get focus. And so you need to flatten the organization. And so we did, we actually cut out two layers in the organization. We cut out in, in the management layer because we had, I think it was uh, six layers of management before you started even getting down to the workers. So, um, so that's the first trend that we see. Um, the second is to maintain orthodoxy, um, to be true to the apostles' teaching, there began to be emphasis on the creeds and later on the church councils. Now, why is this? This became much more important as the disciples are beginning to die off. How are we going to give leadership and focus and deal with conflicts that may arise in the church? 
The other key part of it not only was the creeds and the councils, but the apostolic secession. So you answered the two questions that we talked about before. In other words, what is authoritative and who gets to decide? And that became a big issue when there were struggles, theological struggles in the church and heresies that would prop up. Who is going to make the decisions? What's the process we're going to use to decide that this is consistent with what Jesus taught and what is inconsistent with what Jesus taught? So this was an ongoing. And you can see in the few weeks we've been looking at this, that the longer the church stayed together, the more this apostolic succession became incredibly important. Now, I'm going to make a statement now, and I'll probably repeat myself later on. But by the time you get, again, this is my bias, but by the time you get to the end of the fourth century, when the canon is finally affirmed by everyone, you should have been able to remove that second question, who gets to decide? Hey, because scripture should have made that decision. But the problem was, it's not everyone has scripture in their home. Not everyone could read the scripture. So by th this natural selection, you had a group of people who could read it all of a sudden who are making decisions about what the scripture meant, how it is applied to our lives. So you can see how this is a thorny issue uh, as the church progressed. And we've already talked, looked at that. Uh, th next issue, the church moved from looking at repentance which scripture Paul writes, Jesus talks about, um, and even John the Baptist, John the Baptizer talks about, talks about repentance. And so this was huge in the life of the church. We need to repent. Okay. First John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. That whole idea of repenting, confessing our sins, repenting. But over time, it, it morphs to penance. Now, in the, as we said when we talked about this maybe a month or two ago, that at the beginning, penance and repentance were interchangeable terms. But over time, you don't hear that much about repentance, and you hear more about penance. Because what was penance doing? Penance was the effort to say, do you really mean it that you're sorry? Prove it to me. And that proving to somebody leads to a list of, well, this is what you have to do. And that over time is what penance is. It works. Eventually, that's going to even become part of the sacramental system. We took, looked at the sacraments, the seven sacraments as an act of grace. They were a form of works. Did the church believe in faith? Yes, it did. Unfortunately, it was faith plus. And then you get to fill in the plus. The church, as we were talking here in the last few weeks, became more political. Tony did an excellent job when he was talking about the, the Roman Empire and, and how it inter, interacted with the church. Um, and so at first, obviously, before Christianity became the state religion, um, it had no power. <laughs> it, it had no political influence. But as soon as it becomes the state religion, then all of a sudden it has a voice. And the question every organization has is when you have a voice, what do you do with it? Do you try to help people? Or do you try to be self-serving with the voice? We see this in politics. You know, that we, we see people who go with the expectation, I'm going to go to Washington and I'm going to help my constituents. And after they've been there for 20, 30 years, you're wondering who in the world they're helping. Because they went there impoverished, and now they're multimillionaires, and you know their salaries are not that big. You say, how is this working out? How does this work? Okay. So the church, and I think it's just it's human nature, not the godly side, but the ungodly side, just tends to take on more power. And so over time, especially when the capital of the Roman Empire moved from Rome to Constantinople in the fourth century, there was kind of a vacuum that was left behind. And guess who filled the vacuum? The Bishop of Rome. He filled that vacuum. He kind of was the, the balancing factor in the Western end of the empire. And so empire, so it becomes much more political. And then we were ending last week looking at with this 
convergence of church and state. The question we need to ask is, how does the church deal with the culture? We, we ended last week looking at three approaches the church has. Do I assimilate the culture, which is what many were fearing was happening in the church? Do I withdraw from the culture? And we started looking at the monastic movements, and we're going to continue that thought today. So I'm going to withdraw from the culture. Or, as I believe with Jesus and Peter particularly, and of course, Paul's whole approach was, do you engage the culture? I believe Bible is very clear that we are to engage the culture. Is there a time for us to withdraw? Sure. Jesus withdrew so he could pray. Jesus would to withdrew so that he could be energized for the ministry that he needed to do. The disciples did the same thing. So there are periods when we withdraw, but we don't disengage ourselves from the culture in doing so, which unfortunately is what happened with many of the monastic movements. So let's look at a major monastic movement that we're familiar with. We've heard this before. In fact, in most major cities, there's a a Catholic school called Benedictine. (laughs) We had one in Cleveland. It was actually a powerhouse in football and sports uh, in the greater Cleveland area. But the Benedictines come from the sixth century. It was the first monastic order started in Italy. Remember, monasticism started with individuals going in isolation from everything. But the church began to see that's not really engaging the culture. So they started looking at more communal coming together. And so the Benedictines are an example of a communal where people come together, they withdraw from society, but they do it in relationship with others of like-minded. And so this was started in Italy. The rule of Benedictine, which was a rule that really influenced all of the major orders of the West, um, was committed to poverty, chastity, and obedience to their rules. So they had a series of rules. Remember, they came up with the eight hours to sleep, eight hours to work, and eight hours to pray, right? So what did they do commonly, the Benedictines? Um, And and what was important? What, What value did they bring? Well, they taught people the dignity of work because it was part of their DNA. You just didn't live off what people gave you. You actually had to work. They they had their own gardens. And we know later on they had great wineries uh, th- th- that came out of it. They copied the scripture. They, they, they continued the practice of the scribes. The Bible calls the scribes. And then not, not only did they copy the scripture, but during the dark ages, they copied just about everything. In fact, if it wasn't for the church and these monasteries, much of what we know during this period would have been totally lost because they kept it alive. They were kind of the educational center of the universe. They also began ministries, um, providing the public, orphanages, widows, local health care, and food banks. And of course, they became the source of clergy. So people who became priests or elders in churches many times would come out of these orders like the Benedictine order. Life was relegated for holiness with the following common focus. So in their eight hours of prayer and life, they would be involved with meditation. Now, when we think of meditation, we tend to, our mind thinks of Eastern meditation, but you know, meditation is a good word. The Psalms are filled where we're to meditate on God's word day and night. Question, meditation is not the problem. It's what you're meditating on becomes the issue. What do I meditate on? And so meditation was a big part, obviously prayer fasting, a lifestyle of simplicity. It's interesting. There's all kinds of books now in the popular media today about how to declutter or simplify your life. Church has been talking about that for centuries. Solitude, getting alone with God. Service, confession, and study, not only of the scriptures, but of the the classics of their day. Now, there have been some classic books that have been written in the last, I want to say, 40 years to the Protestant community on 
church disciplines because it's a relatively new concept for most Protestants, but it, it's been part of the church life, especially on the Roman Catholic side, all the way back at least to the sixth century, if not before, these disciplines where I take time, I actually structure time to meditate, structure time to prayer, have times of fasting, and, and on and on it goes. So I find it interesting how these things kind of come full circle. Uh, as people begin to have a hunger for God, they start going back to things that people have known have been valuable to them in the past. So that's one of the orders. There's another order that we don't necessarily view as a monastic order, but it was. It was one of the few that also was a military. Okay? We know the Knights Templar. There's been lots of fascinating stuff discussed about the Knights Templar. They were only around for about 200 years. They were a military order that was formed in Jerusalem in 119. And their primary purpose was to protect the pilgrims as they would get off the boats on the Mediterranean Sea and make their way inland to the religious sites and to Jerusalem. But their full name was the Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ. <laughs> now, there's a mouthful. Uh, they were also referred to as the Temple of Solomon. Okay, And this was the first time you have secular knights banding together to, to take monastic vows. And they became the first standing army since Roman times, and, and they fought alongside the Crusades and the Crusades. Now, interesting about these knights that I didn't know, they lived very, very strict lives. They were forbidden to participate in tournaments. Now, tournaments may not have been a big issue in the Middle East, but they were a big issue in Europe. You, you know, and there's, you know, you talk about, you know, they had those long, what are they called? Jousting sticks, you know, the tournaments that took place. The knights were forbidden to participate. They spoke little and they never laughed. I know some people, they're not called knights, my uncle, but, you know, that's, that's another story, okay? Um, two, they did not bathe. They were forbidden, though, to grow their hair long, although they had these unkept beards. So their hair itself was short, probably so they could fit their helmets on, okay? They slept with the lights on and fully dressed because they were ready for action, okay? And they were forbidden to gamble, to hunt, or to play games. Pretty interesting. I have no idea where they came up with these rules, but those were the rules of this order. They were initially funded by the alms from the traveling pilgrims. That's how they supported themselves. But eventually, the Holy See, which is the papacy, and many European monarchies began to recognize their value. They, they introduced things like... Um, kind of like a checking system. So if you started out your journey pilgrimage to Paris, you could go to the Knights Templar there in Paris, and you could give them, you know, 100 pieces of gold, and they'd give you a piece of paper. And when you arrived in the Middle East, you go find another Knights Templar, the, the local bank there, and they would do the swap. Now, there was little fees attached to it, um, and so, again, that's how they made money. So they kind of developed the first what we would kind of think of as a banking system. But within the 200 years, they became owners of 9,000 tax-free estates. Now, when we talk about estates, we're not talking about five acres, 10 acres. We're talking about hundreds, if not thousands of acres of these estates were. And they were only subject to the Pope. They became so powerful, they deified all secular authorities which became a problem for the king of France. And so he decided he was going to deal with this. And he did. He came up with this, kind of tricked everyone, and he basically put them all under arrest at the same time so they couldn't defend each other. Within time, even those in Rome began to, you know, they fell out of favor with Rome, and so they disbanded and basically condemned these knights. But they were an example of monastic movement, not one we would normally think of. But let's look at some of the ones we more noticeably would think about. 
because again, the, the influence of these monastic orders ebbed and flowed over time. And some of them began to ignore this Benedict Prune. Some were beginning to buy cleric positions. They were ignoring celibacy and they were becoming incredibly, increasingly wealthy. So what's the solution? Well, in for the last 200 years, the solution here is we, we split the church and went and formed another congregation down the street. Well, that's kind of what they did back then too. They just went off and formed another monastic movement. If this one kind of lost its way and wasn't being faithful to what they started out with, so we're just going to go form another monastic movement. You can see this attitude of starting something new is long before the reformers ever came into the play here. So we've got one called the Dominicans or the Black Friars or the Order of Preachers. I didn't know they were called that. And they were formed in 1216 A.D. And they had an interesting one because it was common throughout that we used power to influence people. We go into an area that didn't know anything about Christianity, and the army would go in, and then they would come and say, are you going to be a follower of Christ? If you answer yes, you live. If you answer no, you die or get persecuted. Well, you had all kinds of people. And the Dominican says, that's a terrible way to evangelize. And so they said, why don't we reason with people? Why don't we present a reason why you want to be Christ followers? I was, Tony and I were talking about this recently, we're talking about as a youth pastor, the power of hell. Okay, I don't know what, you, what your views on hell, but you can, adolescents sometimes are impressionable and you, and you can say, if you don't get right with God, you're going to hell. Okay. And why, and from a biblical point of view, that may be a true statement. The point is, it's not very motivating because I don't feel the flames of hell every day like I did maybe yesterday. So, what is the reason I, I want to follow Christ? Is it only to escape something because I'm fearful of something, or is it because I love my master and my savior? Okay, well, this is what the Dominicans. We're arguing, hey, listen, this approach to evangelism you guys are using is not very effective because they're only becoming Christ followers because they're afraid of their lives and losing everything. Okay, so they became strong teachers they, um, and strong preachers of Christian doctrine, and their role usually was done by bishops. So they saw the bishop as having primarily this role and function. Then there are the Franciscans. Who are the largest order today, the Franciscans? They were started, again, shortly thereafter, 1223, started in Italy by a guy most people have heard of, Francis of Assisi, a very wealthy person who basically gave away all of his wealth and, and, and basically lived a poor life, he, a vow of absolute poverty and charity. Um, and so this was huge. It was about going and helping people. And then the one that became really influential, particularly when the new world was being formed, because the Jesuits were usually the ones that accompanied those that came over with, with the Spanish and with the French. And they were started in the 1500s by Ignatius of Loyola, okay? not the basketball team from outside of Chicago. That's also Loyola, but different Loyola. Um, and they were active, obviously, also in missions, very strong in missions, and they usually would travel with the conquerors as they went into the new world. So these were some of the monastics. Now, by the time we become familiar with them on this side, they probably, just like the old orders, had strayed far from their original intent. But this is what was happening in the church. There were people in the church early on, long before the reformers, who said, we have a problem, Houston. We need to figure out how to fix this. And this, at that point, primarily was the solution that was used. Now, let's take a look at the conditions that really kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. Now, remember, we talked about the Bishop of Rome. He's no different than the Bishop of Antioch, the Bishop of Alexandria, the Bishop of Ephesus. He's basically the lead pastor of the church. But over time, he gets more and more influence among all of the bishops. 
And when Rome fell in the fifth century and the emperor, of course, has moved further east, the Bishop of Rome truly becomes the guardian of civilization almost by default. It's not that someone sat down and says, I think this is a good idea. It's just, there's a vacuum. You're so far removed. It's kind of like people in California, I have no idea what's going on in Washington, DC. They feel like they're on the other side of the world. Or how about if you'd like to be in Siberia and you are, I think it's 11 time zones, or maybe it's 10 time zones from Moscow, the capital, okay? Things happen when you're far removed from the powers that be. So what were some of the factors that strengthened the Bishop of Rome, who from this point forward, we're going to refer to as the Pope? First of all, they had the power of excommunication and interdict. In other words, they can forbid someone to give the sacraments or to take the sacraments. So it's like you can stay in the church, but you can't do this until you, you do X, Y, Z. Okay, penance or whatever you needed to do. Excommunication obviously was the ultimate. Ambrose was notorious for using excommunication as a threat, uh, a bishop uh, against the emperors. Okay, and so the emperors were basically, and in up until the Middle Ages, uh, th this excommunication had a tremendous influence on secular authority. But there were two documents that were supposedly written in the eighth and ninth century that supported the preeminence of the Pope. One was called the Donation of Constantine, okay? It actually under Gregory the Great. Now, Gregory the Great was from the sixth century, and it declares that Constantine's last will and testament gives Rome as in the Western part of the empire to Rome. So if you have any doubts, you just whip out this document and say, see, I'm in charge because the emperor said so long time ago. Okay. Um, it also, this document established purgatory as a place where we put, kind of hold people until they get that, remember that scale of good works and, you know, bad works kind of even up. And so I got to stay in purgatory until I get rid of all of the bad stuff in my life, and the preeminence of the Eucharist as the central part of the worship service. And it was at this point where they established that it actually becomes the body and blood of Christ, that we re-sacrifice Christ every time we do the Mass. All that came in the donation of Constantine. And then there was another one that I'm not so sure I'm going to say correctly, so Tony may be here. The Decretals, close. The K of Isidore, and it was supposedly a list of decisions by the church councils extolling the greatness of the Pope and the preeminence. So there was a natural progression where you could see the Bishop of Rome taking on more power, but you whip out these two documents, and man, you're it. The only problem was, a few hundred years later, they determined that both of those documents were total forgeries. They were not real, didn't happen. Again, it was somebody, don't know who, but these are the individual's names that unearthed that because they, they figured out that these documents were written to people that weren't born yet. They began to start seeing inconsistency in the document themselves that says, this doesn't make any sense. But by that time, of course, this was 1400s, that influence has already been established for hundreds of years. Interesting. Now, church begins to fragment here. See, in the West, there begins to be more of an emphasis on Latin. The East is still using Greek. Remember, the, the Greek was the lingua franca, franca the, the language of the people, the language of commerce, kind of like English is today. Greek was. It was all the way back to Alexander the Great, it continued through the Roman, per Roman period, and so it continues in the East. But Latins begin to take on more influence, especially when Jerome translates the Bible into Latin. But look at the characteristics between these two, because the church is going to split in 1054 
AD schism. It took hundreds of years before it finally happened, but it was growing. In the West, the church is over the state. This, I think Ambrose really sets this in play. Whereas in the Greek, that's uh, the side and the east side, in the orth what we'll later call the Orthodox Church, the state is still over the church. And you see a little interesting, if you've been reading between the lines, what's happened in the Russian Orthodox Church with what Putin's doing in Ukraine, because the Russian Orthodox Church and the Ukraine Orthodox Church are very, very tied together, but it's driving a wedge between those, those churches that's taking place there. In the West, the Pope is the final authority. Ah, when the East said we've had enough, they say it's the church councils that have the authority. It's not in one person interesting how the orthodox handled that theology is for theologians in the west theology is for everyone again because everyone spoke greek but not everyone spoke latin and so latin became the language of the privileged and the few celibacy was demanded in the west but in the east celibate marriage was actually permitted except for bishops and even that sometimes there was debate whether that should happen. In other words, they did not demand it of their priests, of their elders in the church. They didn't demand, demand celibacy the way the West did. And then some of you are familiar with the concept of icons. Okay? They, those would be your paintings, uh, some of the statues that are taking place there. The West, for the most part, were opposed to icons. But if you've ever seen the picture or gone inside an Orthodox church, they've got artwork everywhere because this is big now by definition icon simply means this it shows something that has significance behind it so for example in protest most protestant churches we see the communion as the emblems that represent what christ did for us that's a form of icon there's nothing powerful in the emblems themselves, but they speak to something that has power behind it. In this case, the actual death of and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that's what I got. So the West were opposed to icons, even though we they later on they're going to they're not going to worship, but they're going to pray to Mary and they're going to pray to the saints. Um, so because I'm not worthy to come into the presence of God, so I got to go to somebody for me that will come into the church but at first it wasn't that way big difference between the two so eventually the church splits how did that happen the pope excommunicates the archbishop of constantinople the capital where the empire is okay and at that point because he's excommunicated he basically takes all of his people and says fine we want nothing to do with you guys you go off do your thing we'll go off and do our thing and we officially we have the split that takes place okay uh, between the west now which is now called the roman catholic church and the east which are called the orthodox eastern orthodox churches and there are many of them there okay so let's continue on one of the things the popes had the ability to do was call people to action well one of the action led to the crusades so i thought we'd just take a moment and look at the crusades not a real bright spot in the life of the church hey in 638 a.d pilgrimages became much more common um tony told us this i think i might have shared it is that constantine's mom was a very very devout christian her name was helen and so helen kind of went on a mission and she went into the Middle East um, and she looked for places, events, things that represented what Jesus did, where he was born, the Sermon on the Mount, where he obviously died, where he was buried, and basically would commission chapels or churches to be built there. Once that took place, it was just a natural progression that people would want to go and see these pilgrimages and in fact a good catholic made this pilgrimage at one point in their life this this was a considered an important part martin luther did and it changed his life not in the way i think the catholic church expected it to but we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks 
Okay. And so even though Islam by this time in the, in the seventh century, Islam had kind of taken over Jerusalem, they continued to allow these pilgrims to make their pilgrimage. It was lucrative for them. They made money on it. Now, this changed when the Turks, who were also Islamic, but they were a different form of the Turks, when they took over, they put a stop to it. Okay. And so in 1096, the Muslims, these Turks, invaded Turkey. That's where the word Turks come from. Okay. And at that time, Turkey was a Christian nation. It was, you had these large churches in those seven churches that, that John wrote in the book of Revelation, the church at Ephesus, obviously. And when they took power, they, they, this changed. And so because they took this land, and of course, the emperor was there, the Byzantine emperor, he appeals kind of to his counterpart. In this case, it was Pope Urban II. And he says, we need soldiers. We can't raise a large enough army to push back the Turks from invading this territory. And so Urban II, don't know exactly what his reasons that I didn't research that. Tony might know that better than I do. He agreed to participate. And so he goes and he does a call to arms. We call it the crusade. And the intent of the crusade was to recapture the holy places, to save the Byzantine Empire from the Turks, and basically to allow the pilgrims to continue going back to the holy places. That was the intent. Now, to encourage participation, something that was probably familiar but not widely used, at least not in the way it was used during this period, began to have increased focus, and that was indulgences. Okay, It took on a huge power play during the Crusades. Okay, And what was an indulgence? I could pay for my past sins, my present sins, and my future sins. You give enough in the offering plate, and you can cover a multitude of sin. Almost sounds like a phrase we use. Okay, to get into heaven. And oh, by the way, if you get killed while you're in uh, this crusade, you get to bypass purgatory and go straight to heaven. If you manage to survive, you get to come back home, all of your debts and no taxes. This became a huge thing economically for a lot of people who didn't have a whole lot who felt like there is no way I can live a good enough life. So maybe this will take care of my family, take care of lots of things, you know, and so I'm just going to participate. And they raised a huge army. The, actually, it was the only, the first crusade was the only one that really was effective. The rest of them were pretty bad news. Okay. So in 1099, Jerusalem is captured, recaptured from the Muslims. Okay. Now, the army was bigger than they expected, and they captured lands. But instead of giving back the land to the Byzantine, remember, where did most of these crusaders come from? The West, under the Pope. They're now living in the land of the Archbishop of Constantinople under the Byzantine king or of the eastern end of the Roman Empire. And so... The Byzantine emperor, I don't know if he was just gullible or what, thought, hey, they want good. Now things can go back to normal. They don't give back the land. In fact, they form many empires. Okay, They set up kings. So there, there's a kingdom in uh, Edessa, which is in Turkey, uh, Antioch, Syria, Tripoli, Lebanon, Okay, and on and on it goes. And they had these little, little mini empires that, that were controlled. There were eight crusades. Some think there's 10. I, I, in my research, I saw, found there were eight. One of the crusades was a children's crusade that happened in 1212 AD. Somehow, somebody thought this was a good idea to send children to go fight this war. The problem was most of them drowned in the sea before they ever got to the Holy Land. When they got there, they got captured and were sold in slavery if they were not slaughtered. It was a total fiasco. Literally tens of thousands of children were massacred 
in this. On top of that, many Jews, Muslims, and even Eastern Christians were slaughtered because after a while, we ran out of things to conquer. And so on our way there, we might go bypass and we find this little Jewish area and we go and we attack it. Even Constantinople got it on the fourth crusade was attacked by the crusaders. So here's the emperor in Constantinople asking for help. And within a hundred years, his empire is under a threat by the crusaders, supposedly the liberators. The final crusade began in 1270 AD and ended in 1291 with the fall of Acre. Ultimately, the crusades fail because no land was ever kept. Eventually, the Muslims took it all back. It estimates, and again, when you're looking at numbers in the past, it's hard to tell. Just go conservative. It estimate 1 million people died in these 200 years. Some estimates could be as high as 9 million. And we're talking about a world population that's not even close to what it is today. That is a lot, a lot of people that died. And for what? Because after the 200 years were over, it went back to the way it was before, except I think they started allowing the pilgrimages again. So I guess in that way it succeeded. But that's a horrible price to pay for that. What were the results of the Crusades? And I'll close with this slide. There began to be the veneration of the relics. What happened? As the Crusaders went in, they found things or they assumed they found things or they decided they found things like the cross of Jesus. And so they would bring back a sliver of the cross of Jesus. And so every church throughout Europe was wanting some relic from the Holy Land. And so if you go to some of the old, old churches, they'll have encased in something, a sliver of the cross or uh, a drop of blood or whatever, okay, that took place. And so all of a sudden you see relics that if I have a relic in my church, it makes that place more holy, uh, spiritual. We see the increase of trade and currency. After the Crusades are over, the heavy emphasis on land being the mode of, of commerce um, was re reduced by currency. We saw that where we talked about the Knights Templar who began doing something like that. And of course, as the emphasis on land begins to diminish, the whole feudal system slowly begins to unravel. Because in the feudal system, everything was based on agriculture or farm base. And the church became huge landowners. So as the feudal system's breaking up, guess who's starting to lose some of its influence? The church is beginning to lose some of its influence. Luther declared that in the 8th century, when land ownership was at its heyday, it made the church a political power. He recognized the, the association of power and land at one point in history. Obviously, it alienated Jews, Islams, and Eastern Church. Uh, I, I teach at a school that the, um, I forget what it's called, the school mascot was called Crusade, Crusader. And because we have lots of missionaries that go in many parts of the world, there was a cry to say, maybe that's not the you know, we, you know, we want to be trumpeting out there a crusader because it has incredibly negative connotations throughout most of the world, most of the world. So now it's the head of a horse. I have no idea, but we're, we're now the valors, okay, whatever that means. Okay. The Byzantine emperor after the end of the crusade is now weakened. As I said, it was, it was actually attacked in one of the crusades. And we see a high level of intolerance. Tolerance has probably always been there, but it just goes to another level during the Crusades because now everyone lives by the sword. We're actually going to see that that's in the early part of the reformers, they were the recipients of the sword. But when they started getting power, this carried on because they used the sword too to try to keep those that disagreed with them in line. It became a mindset, kind of like the Ozarks were, you know, just kidding. Uh, for those who, who haven't had an opportunity, you want to make sure for those watching that you, you see Tony's presentation on Mondays. He started a series 
called The History of the Ozarks. And even though you may not live in the Ozarks, you will find it fascinating because of its impact throughout our culture. So those are the Crusades. We now are beginning, we've laid the foundation for what's going to lead to the Reformation. And that's what we're going to pick up next week as we've moved from the monastic movement, which was an attempt to reform, to the crusade, which was not really a reformation. It was an attempt to try to deal with, with Islam. And now we're going to be looking at the next major movement of reform, and that's going to be in the reformers themselves. Many people think reform begins with Martin Luther, but for hundreds of years before Martin Luther ever was thought of, there were people that were beginning to teach the concepts. The only problem was they all were killed off. So they, would, they weren't able to, to get entrenched. Luther had some secular governors that protected him and he managed to survive long enough. And we'll talk about some other things that helped allow Martin Luther's reform, reformation to take place. So beginning next week, we're gonna start looking at the reformers, the early reformers before, and then we'll get to Martin Luther. Let's close with a word of prayer. God, I, I look at history and my heart is saddened. Some of the things that have been done in your name had to break your heart. But Lord, help us not to be so much judging others, not even to judge, but Lord, help us to judge ourselves. Are we people of the word? Have we developed our own traditions and our own way of looking at things that influences how we interpret scripture rather than letting scripture interpret itself for us. So we have much to learn from history. Thank you for this time. I pray a blessing on all my friends in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. God bless everyone. Have a great, great day. Take care.